Welcome to this lecture number 19 on this NPTEL course on fluid mechanics for chemical engineering undergraduate students. In the last few lectures our topic of discussion was the derivation and application of integral or macroscopic energy balance and just to quickly remind you the macroscopic energy balance is derived using the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics applies to a system which contains a particular mass of fluid while in many engineering flow applications we deal with flowing systems. So therefore we have to convert the first law of thermodynamics to a control volume which is basically a fixed region of space of interest to us in an engineering operation. So we had to use the Reynolds transport theorem to convert the rate form of the first law of thermodynamics which simply says that d e d t for a system is rate at which heat is transferred minus to the system minus rate at which work is done by the system. Just to reiterate again the work transferred between the system and surroundings involves a sign convention and we are going to follow the sign convention that the work done by the system or the CV on the surroundings is positive while the work done on the system or the CV is negative. So that is why you see a negative sign in this uh, expression for first law of thermodynamics while if you use the other convention that work done on the system is positive then you will have a plus sign. Okay. So that is a sign convention that can also be adopted but we are going to follow this sign convention which is typical in many engineering contexts. Okay. So then use the Reynolds transport theorem. to convert this into a CV formulation wherein you get rho E dV where E is the total energy per unit mass and E is written as the internal energy plus unit mass plus the macroscopic potential energy plus unit mass plus the gravitational potential energy plus unit mass. This is the rate of change of the total energy present in the control volume but this is not all you also have the flux term over the control surface rho E V dot N D A is integral sorry is equal to the rate at which heat is transferred into the system minus rate at which work is done by the system. Now there are various contributions to work okay. suppose you have a control volume which looks like this okay. there so this is a uh, system in which fluid is entering through a pipe and exiting through a pipe let us say. Okay. So now we are going to draw the control volume like this using the red dotted lines now that is the red dotted line therefore becomes the control surface that demarcates whatever is inside which is the control volume from the surroundings now fluid is entering like this here. So the unit outward normal here is like this while the unit outward normal is like this the velocity vector is pointing against the unit outward normal at the inlet and along the unit outward normal at the outlet. Now there are various types of work that, that are possible but what is important for us to understand is that work is done only if there is a force that acts and there is motion in the li line of action of the force. So in this control surface suppose you consider this uh, internal areas where there is flow that where there is no flow because the fluid is stationary at the wall. Okay, that is called the no slip condition which we will see in detail little, little later. Okay. So although a stress acts on these internal surfaces there is no work done on those surfaces because the surface itself is stationary. Okay. So here there is a pressure force that acts there is a normal force that acts okay, and fluid is also flowing so therefore there is a work contribution at the inlet and outlet that will be given by we later saw it to be equal to the inlet and outlet. So there are these normal contributions to the force that comes from the work done by the normal stresses at the inlet and outlet which I will write shortly and there are also shear contributions because of the fact that you can have shear work done by an impeller uh, at the uh, control surface. So having included both these terms we saw that the left side remains as such rho E d V plus integral C s rho E V dot N D A is Q dot 
Now this is denoted as a shaft work okay. this that is associated with pumps, compressors, turbines and so on. So either you could do work on the CV or, or the CV you can extract work out of the CV. Now the term that arises due to the fact that you have a normal force due to pressure is given by rho sorry integral P V dot N D A integral over the inlets and outlets okay. and in general there is no shear work at the entrance and exit because if you choose the control volume that is normal sorry if you should choose the control su surface to be normal to the inlet velocity the shear stresses act in the direction perpendicular to the inlet velocity. So the dot product of these two orthogonal vectors is obviously 0. So the shear work can be set to 0 by choosing the control surface carefully. So after having done all this you therefore get and then we let us simplify v dot n is minus v for inlets is plus v for outlets. So once you do this you get a very simple dv is equal to q dot minus w dot shaft minus integral rho times e plus p by rho plus v for inlets minus rho e plus p by rho v d a over outlets because of this fact okay, that v dot n is minus v therefore minus of minus becomes plus here whereas plus v for inlets well it is minus it is just plus v for outlets so this minus sign stays here. Okay. So this is the integral energy balance now we also said that we can simplify this further by making assumptions of just for the sake of clarity obtaining clarity and okay. so you can use the assumption of uniform flow we of course saw that we can correct this assumption by using the kinetic energy correction factor for the energy balance okay, uh, the alpha term but right now if you assume uniform flow and steady flow and single inlet single outlet when the flow is steady this becomes 0 when the flow is uniform all these quantities all these quantities are independent of the cross section so you can pull it outside the integral same here okay so the area integral becomes just the area of the inlet and outlet so having done that you will get okay e plus p by rho times rho v a at at the outlet is E plus P by rho rho V A at the inlet plus Q dot minus W dot shaft. Okay. Now the mass balance will say for a single steady system at with single inlet and single outlet that rho V A at inlet is the same as rho V A at outlet because at steady state there is no accumulation of mass in the C V. So that is equal to m dot the mass flow rate. So if we divide by m dot we get E plus P by rho at the outlet is E plus P by rho at the inlet plus Q dot by m dot minus W dot shaft by m dot. Now this is nothing but the amount of heat transferred to the CV per unit mass there is no rate involved because you are rate dividing one rate by another rate. So they cancel out and this is denoted as W shaft there is no rate involved anymore. Okay. So now as per second law of thermodynamics okay. so once you expand E to be U plus half V squared plus G Z you get change where delta means change in out minus in u plus half v squared plus p by rho let's write p by rho first 
plus half v squared plus g z in minus so where delta of any quantity is that quantity evaluated at out minus in delta symbol implies that you are evaluating quantity at the outlet minus the quantity at the inlet. So, this is equal to q minus w shaft if I want to use thermodynamics I want to change it to a differential where the inlet and outlets are just separated by a small uh, distance. So, you can convert it to a differential d of u plus p by rho plus half v squared plus g z is del q minus del w shaft. Now, you can now borrow or adopt a relation from thermodynamics d u is t d s minus p d v v is a specific volume which is 1 over density is t d s minus p d of 1 over rho. When you substitute this back out here then you get d u instead of d u. So, I am going to substitute this in the d u here. So, instead of d u I will get t d s minus p d 1 over rho, okay. but d of p over rho will give me d of p over rho will give me p d 1 over rho. Okay. plus 1 over rho d p. Okay. So, I am going to write this as plus p d 1 over rho plus 1 over rho d p plus half d v square plus g d z is del q minus del w shaft. Now, these two terms will cancel each other to give and I am going to bring the del q to the left side to get T d s minus del q plus d p by rho plus half d v square plus g d z is minus del w shaft. Second law of thermodynamics tells you that this term is always greater than or equal to 0. This is second law of thermodynamics. Therefore, and this is basically the amount of work that is lost irreversibility to heat um, and this equality is valid only for a reversible process, but engineering applications involving flow or irreversible processes uh, you do not do them uh, infinitesimally slowly over a sequence of equilibrium states. So, they are irreversible processes therefore, second law of thermodynamics tells us that this is greater than 0 for flow applications. This is the amount of heat sorry amount of uh, energy that is lost as heat and ends up in increasing the internal energy of the fluid of the fluid. This is also called as the viscous dissipation of energy. viscous dissipation of energy. Now, from the point of view of uh, fluid mechanics this is the amount that is lost. So, these are termed as losses. Okay. So, this is written as W L amount of energy or work that is lost. So, you rewrite your energy equation simplified energy equation as P by rho plus half V square plus G Z at outlet minus p by rho plus half v square plus g z at the inlet is minus w shaft minus w loss losses. These are the viscous uh, this is the viscous dissipation of energy that is uh, that implies that energy is transferred from macroscopic uh, forms like work uh, to uh, internal energy. Okay. Now, how to compute these losses we will come to a little later uh, when we do differential balances, but right now uh, this you have to sort of know the losses if you want to find the pressure difference and so on. So, either the losses come as an input to the calculation through experimental data or they come out as an output of the calculation. Okay. 
So, this is the energy balance after taking into account the losses. Now, after finishing uh, this, we also uh, looked at uh, the application of integral energy balance uh, to flow measurement, where we try to understand restriction flow meters, wherein essentially you had a configuration like this. you had a gradual contraction and an expansion. So, essentially fluid is flowing like this eventually occupying the full region. So, there are recirculating zones okay, like this on both uh, sides. Okay. So, idea is here to have a knowledge suppose you take a streamline that goes from here point 1 to point 2. Okay. Now, if I measure the pressure difference between these two points okay, there is a delta p okay. can I relate it to the velocity at 1 okay. that is the idea. So, you measure pressure difference between two points one upstream of the contraction and another downstream of the contraction and see whether you can uh, relate the pressure to the velocity. We found that after making simplifying assumptions that there are no losses and by applying the Bernoulli equation between point 1 and 2. Remember that the Bernoulli equation is essentially uh, gross simplification of the energy balance by taking the C V to be a stream tube and uh, by assuming that there is no viscosity in the surrounding fluid. So, there is no work done and by shrinking the stream tube to a streamline you find that uh, P by rho plus half V squared plus G Z is a constant along a streamline. So, this is the Bernoulli equation. So, by applying this to these two points along this streamline, we found that we can say that P 1 minus P 2 is rho by 2 V 2 squared minus V 1 squared. And by using mass conservation, we said that V 1 A 1 is V 2 A 2. Therefore, we were able to write this as P 2 is 2 P 1 minus P 2 by rho 1 minus A 2 squared by A 1 squared whole to the power half. Um, so, this was the theoretically expected V 2 from here we can find the theoretically expected mass flow rate as rho V 2 A 2 is equal to A 2 divided by root of 1 minus a 2 squared by a 1 squared square root of 2 rho p 1 minus p 2. So, what is the idea? The idea here is that by measuring this pressure difference between points 1 and 2 and by knowing the area a 2 and a 1 and by knowing the density we can find the mass flow rate. Okay. But this is a theoretically uh, for theoretically estimated mass flow rate, but it has a lot of assumptions. So, in reality the observed mass flow rate will not be the same as this, because we have assumed that there are no losses okay, uh, which is a gross oversimplification. And another thing is that uh, we do not know what is the flow area at point A 2 at point 2, we do not know what is the area, because the flow area is only this not the entire because of the recirculation zone occupies uh, a zone like this until the streamline occupies the entire the cross section. So, this area is something that we do not know. So, usually what is done is to use the throat area this region is called the throat the area of the minimum cross section of the uh, flow meter. Okay. So, instead of A 2 now therefore, you write m dot observed. Okay or actual is a t instead of a 2 you write a t, because that is something that we know from the construction of the device a t squared by a 1 squared root 2 rho p 1 minus p 2. But since there are so many approximations that are involved there will be the actual mass flow rate will be some constant which has to be fitted experimentally or empirically by uh, doing the following experiment by knowing the given mass flow rate. 
okay and by knowing the pressure by measuring the pressure drop we can fit the constant so that this equation is satisfied and then this can be used to create calibration charts for a given meter uh, that is how the constant c changes okay as a function of flow velocity and so on that will give us way to measure or way to measure uh, way to uh, compute mass flow rate okay in a real uh, application by simply measuring the pressure difference uh, at an upstream point of the flow meter and uh, at the downstream point of the flow meter so that is the idea of restriction flow meters we also mentioned that uh, the uh, this is just generic discussion and in practice there are orifice meters and venturi meters which all fall into this restriction flow meter uh, class of flow measuring devices but one drawback of restriction flow meters is that you will be able to measure only the average velocity cross section average velocity over the entire cross section of the uh, pipe uh, but suppose for some in some applications if you need the local velocity at a given point in the cross section of the pipe then what do we do okay so this is where we left off in the last lecture we just started this discussion on what are called pitot tubes okay now one way to measure the pressure in a flowing liquid is the following suppose you have a pipe or a channel in which fluid is flowing you can make a small hole a pressure tab this is called a pressure tab or a wall tab and let us say fluid is flowing on the average in this direction then uh, it turns out that there is no normal variation of pressure if the streamlines are straight which we will see later okay if the streamlines are parallel then no normal variation in pressure so we can just measure okay the pressure here by by having a small tap and then connecting it to the manometer which is exposed to the atmosphere so you can measure the gauge pressure at this point of a flowing fluid by simply having a, a wall tap so the gauge pressure in a flowing fluid can be measured by a pressure tap and a manometer it's called a also a wall tap okay but that is not sufficient to calculate the local velocity at any point in the fluid okay in order to do that what we have to do is what is called use what is called a static pressure probe essentially what the static pressure probe is it has okay a small tube okay and there are two holes okay at the top and bottom okay so this one is another way of measuring the pre pressure in a flowing fluid so the pressure that happens in the bernoulli equation is also called this is the bernoulli equation this is also called the static pressure one way to measure the static pressure that is a pressure in a flowing fluid is to use a wall tap another way is to introduce the static pressure probe which is a very thin tube shape like this now fluid is flowing like this okay and this region will therefore feel the pressure of the flowing fluid and if it is connected to a manometer okay then you will be able to measure okay the pressure that is present inside a flowing fluid which is also called the uh, static pressure uh, which is also called the static pressure uh, the key thing is to align this in the flow direction this must be aligned in the flow direction okay now another quantity of interest is called the stagnation pressure let me explain what this means the stagnation pressure is that pressure 
hypothetically suppose a fluid is flowing along a streamline suppose you bring it to rest okay you decelerate it to a zero velocity by a frictionless process so you decelerate a fluid to zero velocity this is a conceptual idea by a frictionless process in reality of course it's not possible to uh, you know in general to have a frictionless decay of uh, deceleration of a fluid to zero velocity therefore but it's a conceptual idea it's a concept that if you are able to decelerate a fluid to zero velocity by a frictionless process then okay what will happen is that if you take the streamline okay and apply bernoulli equation between point 1 and 2 okay here the fluid is velocity of the fluid is zero okay if the velocity is zero here and it is v not here if you apply bernoulli between point 1 and 2 bernoulli equation between point 1 and 2 what will happen is that p1 by rho plus g1 z plus v not square which is the upstream okay let's call uh, all these terms as uh, let's not call this v not let's just call it v let's just call the velocity in the fluid as v plus v square is at the point this is called a stagnation point where the fluid velocity is 0 it's called the stagnation point okay at the point where the fluid velocity is 0 this becomes equal to let's denote the subscript at this point as p0 plus g1 sorry this gz1 and similarly g z0 plus v0 squared but v0 squared is 0 because the fluid is static that it has gone to zero velocity now if you assume that the elevations are the same then these two terms cancel out so then that gives you an expression for v squared this is not v2 squared this is simply uh, let's call this v squared so v squared is uh, p0 minus p1 by rho or v uh, since you have v squared by 2 should have v squared by 2 here so v is 2 p naught minus p 1 by rho whole to the half so this essentially says that the entire pressure head is there is in on the upstream at point 1 there is a pressure head as well as the kinetic energy head so both the pressure head and the kinetic energy head are at, po at the stagnation point are converted to just pressure because the kinetic energy head is 0 there okay. So that gives you an estimate for what is the velocity upstream. So if you measure the pressure at a stagnation point okay and uh, if you measure the static pressure which is the pressure in a flowing fluid then that gives you the velocity uh, at which you want to you are measuring the static pressure okay. Suppose you are able to measure this pressure difference between a stagnation point and another point where the fluid is flowing okay then you can estimate the what is the local velocity of the fluid at that point where you have measured the static pressure now how do we do this experimentally okay so this is conceptually how it comes about but we also have to find a way out experimentally and it is done by what is called the pitot tube the pitot tube is a way to measure stagnation pressure okay so how it works is the following so you have a tiny tube okay it's a small hole and which is aligned in the direction of flow and the fluid comes to rest at this point okay approximately and therefore if you connect this to a manometer you will get the stagnation pressure with respect to the gauge pressure uh, with respect to the atmospheric pressure that is the gauge stagnation pressure okay so the pitot tube can measure stagnation pressure the pitot tube can measure stagnation pressure okay but there is also another variation that's called the pitot static tube which 
uh, simplifies the two measurements in a single uh, device okay, which, which makes possible to measure both stagnation pressure and static pressure and the difference between them in a single device this is called the pitot static tube which goes like this which looks like this. So, you have okay, a tiny hole okay, and there is the inner one the inner tube okay, uh, is one tap which measures the stagnation pressure because fluid is coming like this. And then there are holes which measure the static pressure. So, okay, this. so let us show it with some other color. So, the, the inner tube this gives you the static pressure P whereas, the outer uh, uh, the sorry the sorry this uh, the tubes where the holes are on the surface gives a measure of the static pressure P whereas, this tube where the fluid comes to a halt it gives a measure of the stagnation pressure P naught. If you connect these two ends to a manometer this change in pressure okay, will directly give you what is the local velocity using the formula we just derived because we derived this formula okay, which says that V is 2 square root of 2 P naught minus P divided by rho whole to the half. Since we know P naught minus P through the measurement by connecting a manometer between this inner tube and outer tube, then we can directly substitute that value out here and you will get a measure measure of the local velocity. So, you can place you can imagine placing the pitot static tube at various points in the cross section of, uh, uh, of a pipe or a channel and you can therefore, measure uh, the local velocity at each and every point. Okay. As I have told you some time back the velocity uh, that uh, of a fluid that flows within a, uh, in, in, inside a tube or a channel varies at various points in the cross section of the channel and that can be measured by using the pitot uh, static tube because it, it gives you a handle to measure the local uh, fluid velocity. Okay. Now, this is completes our discussion on uh, flow measurement. So, and I will uh, what I will do next is to apply the engineering uh, balances that is both uh, that is all the three balances mass, momentum and energy to a couple of problems to illustrate the subtle points that come out upon uh, applic applying this mass by in integral balances. Because in general what happens uh, while using integral balances is that we do not have all the data to uh, uh, complete uh, completely solve a problem. Therefore, we are forced to make assumptions uh, assumptions such as that there is no viscous shear stress existing on a wall uh, when we use the momentum balance for the simple reason that we do not know in a complex engineering situation what those forces are. So, we are forced to make the assumption that uh, uh, those forces are negligible, but then such assumptions may work in some context and they may not work in some other context. So, this is always an issue while applying engineering uh, sorry while applying macroscopic or integral balances to engineering applications because the because of lack of uh, complete information to solve the integral balances. So, this I will try to show you in the context of two problems. Okay. First let us imagine applying integral balances. So, imagine you have a sudden expansion of a flow. So, you have fluid flowing and you have one station one upstream. So, let us draw the C V uh, and another stream okay, let us me draw it again. So, you have fluid flowing there is a sudden expansion you have station one upstream and station 2 downstream of the expansion. Okay, whenever you have an expansion what happens is there are losses because not all the energy that you put in by virtue of let us say a pressure drop goes in pushing the fluid in the flow direction. There are recirculating zones which are just uh, there because of the sudden expansion which cause additional losses such losses are called expansion losses. 
So, let us say fluid is flowing with a given velocity and we want to be able to find the amount of viscous losses that happen in a sudden expansion. So, we are now going to calculate the expansion losses the viscous losses uh, that occur in the energy balance that is our aim when you have a sudden expansion. Now the equations that we have are the three balances mass momentum and energy. So, we want to be able to find uh, the losses viscous losses due to the sudden expansion. Uh, so, using the three balances now how do we go how are we going to do that. Now, if you want to do if you want to use the energy balance to calculate the viscous losses as I have told you we need to know what is the pressure drop between point 1 and 2. If you want to know if you want to know what is the pressure drop between point 1 and 2 then you have to use the momentum balance uh, between these two points uh, between those two uh, control surfaces points in the control surface uh, you apply the momentum balance across these two points to estimate delta p for that we need to know what are the forces ok. So, let me just draw this diagram once again ok. So, as the fluid is flowing there are two types of forces one is the tangential force acting between point 1 and 2 on this surface ok. Other is the normal force acting on this suppose you imagine this to be a pipe ok this pipe is going like this and it is suddenly expanding to a bigger pipe. So, there is an annular region ok where you have this normal force due to pressure. So, there are two types of forces that act uh, on the surfaces of this C V ok. So, we have to keep that in mind. Now, let us first use the uh, so let us use assumptions that uh, we will use alpha 1 is alpha 2 is approximately 1 beta 1 is beta 2 is approximately 1 that is essentially we are saying that let us assume that the flow is in the turbulent regime ok just to keep the uh, flow to be re reasonably uniform. So, you have A 1 V 1 is A 2 V 2 this is mass conservation for an incompressible fluid this is equation number 1. The momentum balance tells you that at steady state 0 is rho A V 1 square minus rho A 1 V 1 square rho A 2 V 2 square plus P 1 A 1 minus P 2 A 2 minus F where P 1 A 1 are the forces P 1 A 1 and P 2 A 2 are the forces acting when the fluid is entering and leaving ok the control surface and F has both the tangential and normal uh, components. So, I just I just told this is the normal component due to pressure these are the tangential components ok in the direction of flow ok. So, but we are going to say that the normal component is simply the pressure ok times A 2 minus A 1 because this is the annular area remember over which the pressure is acting and the negative sign is because the force is acting in the uh, direction opposite to the flow direction. So, you have to put a negative sign ok. So, that is one thing that is a normal force the shear stresses exerted by the fluid on the solid surfaces are very difficult to calculate or estimate because we need a more detailed model such as a microscopic uh, or um, differential momentum balance to get that information. So, due to the lack of that information either from a more fundamental model or from experiments we merely set it to 0 at this point ok. So, this is an assumption that we have to live with because uh, because it is otherwise it is very difficult to find what the tangential forces are due to shear stresses ok. So, the momentum balance becomes rho a 1 v 1 square minus rho a 2 v 2 square plus p 1 a 1 minus p 2 a 2 minus minus p a 2 minus a 1 ok. So, this is what we have at. So, now the point is this p is the pressure at the uh, point where the sudden expansion occurs. So, let us call that plane as plane E ok because that is where the pressure is being exerted ok. So, you can also rewrite this as 0 is 
rho a 1 v 1 square minus rho a 2 v 2 square plus p 1 minus p e. Okay. Sorry, there is a there are two negative signs. So, let us remove one okay. plus p 1 minus uh, I am sorry there, there are two negative signs that is ok um, plus p 1 minus p e okay, times a 1 plus or minus uh, or we can even write plus p e minus p 2 times a 2 and then minus f tangential which is neglected in our approximation. So, now we have to know what is the difference between p e and p 1. Um, because P e is the pressure at the expansion whereas P 1 is the pressure at the upstream of the uh, uh, expansion where the fluid is flowing with some uniform velocity. Okay. Now, this the pressure between point 1 and point e differs because of the fact that fluid is flowing in this short segment, but by choosing this station 1 sufficiently close to the expansion we can assume that P 1 will be very close to P e because the only thing we are now ne neglecting is the viscous losses due to the flow in that short segment. So, we are going to assume that P 1 is approximately P e. So, we have then by rewriting this equation P 1 minus P 2 okay, by rho is V 2 square times 1 minus A 2 by A 1. Okay. This is from the momentum balance, this is what the momentum balance gives us the integral momentum balance after making the assumption two assumptions that um, the shear stresses are 0 and the pressure at the sudden expansion is the same as the pressure at the upstream. Now, if you use the energy balance integral energy balance you will get that P 2 by rho plus half V 2 square plus G Z 2 is P 1 by rho plus half V 1 square plus G Z 1 sorry G Z 1 uh, minus viscous losses. Uh, there is no shear uh, there is no shaft work done because there are no shafts that are cutting across the control surface through this simple expansion. Now, one thing that we can say safely is that the elevations of the upstream and downstream uh, are roughly the same. So, there is not much uh, difference potential difference due to gravity head. Now, then we have to substitute for P 2 minus P 1 from the uh, momentum balance to get an expression for viscous loss. So, you have P 2 rho by rho minus P 1 by rho which is obtained from the momentum balance after substituting that here we will get an expression for viscous loss which is P 1 minus P 2 by rho plus half v 1 square minus v 2 square here I have not substituted p 1 minus p 2. So, instead of this p 1 minus p 2 we have to essentially substitute that. So, you will get the viscous loss L viscous the viscous losses due to expansion as v 2 square times 1 minus a 2 by a 1 plus half a 2 by a 1 whole square minus half. Okay. So, the viscous loss is equal to V 2 square by 2 A 2 by A 1 minus 1 whole square. So, this is the viscous loss that happens due to a sudden expansion. expansion. Of course, um, in reality this will not be exactly true because we have of the assumptions we make. So, we may have to do the measurement and up and then fit a constant with that, but the form of the dependence of the loss on the velocity is exactly like this and the areas uh, of the sudden contraction, but of course, this uh, relation will not be exactly true because of the fact that we have made this assumption that there are no shear stresses and the pressure at the expansion is exactly equal to the pressure upstream and so on. So, certain things are neglected in our analysis 
uh, that makes uh, um, uh, our analysis approximate. But nonetheless, what is powerful uh, about the integral balances is that despite make, making such uh, grossly simplifying assumptions, the functional form of the viscous dependence of the viscous loss on velocity and area is exactly the same as you uh, obtain from the simplifying analysis simply simple analysis, but it is just that the pre factor which turns out to be 1 in our analysis is not exactly 1, but it will be some uh, number which can be fitted by using experimental data. So, this is one example of an application of uh, integral energy balances where we have not just applied one balance, but we have applied a combination of uh, mass momentum and energy balance towards obtaining uh, the viscous losses that, that are there in a sudden expansion. Okay. Now another ex example of an application of the integral energy balance is to obtain the diameter of a free jet that exits from a, from a tube. Okay. So imagine you have a tube in which fluid is flowing under fully developed condition let us say it is laminar for simplicity. Now this fluid is exiting, okay. now the moment it exits uh, it goes into the atmosphere and there are no shear stresses exerted by the surrounding atmosphere on the fluid because uh, the atmosphere is static and it is just air. So the shear stresses uh, exerted by the atmosphere uh, on the fluid is negligible compared to the amount of shear stress the fluid faces when it flows through the uh, wall when, when it flows through the tube a rigid tube with a uh, uh, tube with a rigid wall. So in general the diameter of the tube D and the diameter of the jet D J that emerges uh, sufficiently downstream from the exit of the tube they are not the same okay. because this is simply because of the lack of uh, resistance to flow when the fluid exits into the atmosphere. So what happens is it generally thins a little bit uh, the reason for that is because at constant flow rate okay, uh, the amount of volume that flows inside and outside is the same. So we have V times D is V jet times D jet okay. uh, so this is from mass conservation okay. since the fluid will accelerate that is V will be less than V jet okay, because of the fact that there is uh, no there is no resisting force here okay. the fluid will somewhat accelerate here that means that D jet has to be um, so let us see. So V in general okay, uh, so the, the diameter is in general different at the downstream because of the fact that there is there is no uh, resisting shear forces here okay so v jet will be greater than v therefore d jet will be smaller than d okay to satisfy this uh, mass conservation condition so d jet is in general smaller than d and usually as I have told you in several occasions before that whenever you have a free jet the velocity is uniform across the cross section of the jet. So having said this let us use the mass balance pi d j squared by 4 v 1 sorry pi d squared by 4 v 1 is equal to pi d j squared by 4 v 2 let us call this station as 1 and this station as 2 in our analysis okay now this is mass integral mass balance applied between points 1 and 2 okay of the cv okay this is the mass balance the energy balance okay becomes alpha 2 by 2 times the average velocity squared at 2 is alpha 1 by 2 the average velocity squared at 1 minus the viscous loss. Okay. Now we have assumed that P1 is approximately equals to P2 and Z1 is approximately equal to Z2 because um, okay, so now I am going to make a simple change in the CV that my CV is right at the exit the point 1 
the plane is right at the exit of the tube. So, the velocity profile is just parabolic as it is just exiting the tube, but the pressure is uh, approximately the atmospheric pressure that is the assumption that we make although it is not uh, rigorously correct this is an assumption that pressure as soon as it exits the tube is the same as the pressure far away in the free jet which is atmospheric pressure, but the velocity profile is still parabolic. So, if you do that then alpha 2 is approximately 1 because the flow is uniform here whereas alpha 1 is 2 because the flow is parabolic there. If you use these two relations then I get a simple relation for you cancel let us say uh, alpha 1 is alpha 2 is 1. So, V 2 squared is simply 2 V 1 squared that is one relation that we get and uh, therefore, if we substitute this in the continuity equation we get d square times v 1 is d j square times v 2. So, if I square this equation d square times d to the 4 times v 1 square is d j to the 4 times v 2 square, but v 2 square is simply 2 v 1 square d j to the 4 times 2 v 1 square v 1 v 1 cancels off. So, d j is to the 4 is half d to the 4. So, d z to the 4 is 1 by 2 to the power 1 fourth times d or d z is 0.84 d. This is the equation that we get while using the integral energy balance between points 1 and 2 where the point 1 is just exiting the tube Okay, and the velocity profile is parabolic while the pressure is assumed to be atmospheric. Point 2 is sufficiently downstream the jet where the jet velocity is uniform and the jet uh, pressure is atmospheric. Now, the reason why the jet thins is because as soon as the jet exits the uh, liquid the li jet li the liquid exits the tube then it does not have any shear stress. So, so, it accelerates a little bit. So, its velocity will be more than what it uh, uh, what it was at the tube, but uh, continuity of mass implies that therefore, V 1 A 1 is V 2 A 2 therefore, the jet area will be smaller than the tube area therefore, the jet diameter is smaller than the tube diameter and it is small by a factor of 0.84. Now, we will stop here and in the next lecture we will use the momentum balance integral momentum balance to solve the same problem and we will see that the answers are not exactly the same. So, we will meet in the next lecture.